Hosham Nadi. Welcome, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this Zoom lecture and conversation session organized by Zahra Institute. I am Mustafa Durmas, Deputy Director at Zahra Institute. The Institute as a resource center and a graduate school intends to provide an open collaborative environment for learning, teaching, and scholarship in the fields of Kurdish studies and critical Muslim studies. Our guest speaker today is Alham Humin Far. Alham Humin Far is an assistant professor at Northwestern University. Humin Far is a critical sociologist whose research expertise focuses on the environment, disasters, social inequalities, gender and social movements with an interdisciplinary approach. Humin Far's publications in Persian and English explore social inequalities, gender discrimination, and social movements, as well as problems caused by development projects for local communities, the impacts of environmental degradation on society, and the effects of natural disasters on marginalized groups. Her current research focuses on environmental justice, water governance, and the commodification of nature and social resistance emphasizing political economy in the global south and north. She is working on another study about gender discrimination and women's women in Iran, along with a book project in Persian about the challenge of monolingual education in Iran. Today, Professor Humin Far will talk on Jin Jian Azadi, a women's movement in Iran. Her talk will be 40 minutes followed by 15 minutes QA session. Please ask your questions in the chat or raise your hand. For those who may not know how to raise hand on Zoom, you should see a reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Once you click it, you will see a raise hand button. So now I am leaving the mic to Professor Umin Far. Sepas Mustafa Gian, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I appreciate your interest in women rights in Iran, and I'm thankful to Zahra Institute for inviting me and organizing a talk on women movement in Iran. As many of you guys know, uh, last year, um, a social movement has started in Iran, um, uh, focused on gender justice, actually, and uh, is recognized as the woman life freedom, or uh, in Kurdish, Janjian Azadi. So this is the biggest social movement in Iran after uh, 1979 that we have a revolution and Islamists took power, actually. And this is uh, all about the fighting of Iranian women for justice and freedom, but is not limited to gender justice is talking about ethnic issues, economic justice, and many other issues we have in Iran. This is a secular uh, movement, actually. So today, I will briefly talk about the history and nature of this social movement and the react of the, actually, Islamists after taking power to gender issues in Iran and how women actually try to protect themselves and their right and liberation. So, uh, I would like to share with you guys my PowerPoint, maybe help you guys to follow my talk better. So, uh, maybe you guys know about the uh, name of this social movement, Women Life Freedom, actually, in Kurdish, Janjian Azadi, in Farsi, Zanzindigi Azadi. Uh, this is the main slogan of this social movement in Iran. And because of this main uh, slogan, we call this social movement Women Life Freedom. And again, I believe you know about the spark of this social movement, the murder of Mahsa Jina Amini on September 16 last year by morality police. The response from Iranian, uh, you know, to this murder was really swift. And this protest become immediately one of the biggest social movement in Iran after 1979. Women are at the forefront of their demons in this social movement. So 
Masla Amini was an Iranian Kurdish woman, was arrested by morality police. We will talk about this police, which kind of police and morality police can be in Iran. For wearing her government mandated hijab inappropriately. That was her hijab when she was arrested and was killed by morality police. She was beaten and three days later she died. So that was the spark for this social movement in Iran. A few days after uh, this event, uh, I published a paper in multi-review. It's called The Main Loser of 1979, The Creators of New Revolution in Iran. In my perspective, main loser are women in Iran. And today I'm talking about why I believe the main loser are women. Because after 1979, that Islam is took power, many different social groups are loser in Iran. But the main is women, and I'm talking about this issue and the reaction of women to that uh, situation as social movement. But in general, we believe this social movement in Iran has targeted the entire structure of discrimination and reaction in Iran, and it's not limited to Iran. This is a good message for the rest of Middle East too. So woman life freedom, the spark is the murder of Masa Gina Amini, but it is a historical resistance against a theocratic regime in Iran uh, that took power or monopolized power with violence and brutality after 1979. Soon after the Islamists came to power, they declared the hijab mandatory and approve Shia laws to govern the lives and bodies of women. As a result, Islamic rules and misogynist policies have turned women into second-class citizens, undermined their dignity, human dignity, and implemented gender apartheid in Iran. Because of that, I believe Iranian women are the main loser of 1979. This gender apartheid is unique and happened in Iran after 1979. It doesn't mean before this time, we didn't have gender discrimination in Iran. Of course we had, exactly like Turkey, like Iraq, like all Middle East or in United States or Europe, we have gender discrimination. But gender apartheid is a unique category and I'm talking about that, how Islamic State actually handled this in Iranian society. So here, first, I talk about the mechanism of control under the Islamic Republic of Iran. I mean, control of women, bodies, and lives. And if you would like to know more about this mechanism, I suggest you guys to read this paper. It was written by my colleague and me in 2020. But in general, education, legal or judicial system, and labor market are the main areas for Islamic State to control women bodies. So they would like to institutionalization of Islamic rule after 1979, and their goal was to internalize gender segregation as a normal thing for us. So one of area that I think is really important to know how actually control our lives and body is Islamic Republic of Iran politics targeting women's body. So the, some things is really clear to know about that is hijab code and its rule, morality police, or you know, uh, social exclusion for women or legal punishment. You can see a photo here to show, for example, how they arrested women in uh, streets when they don't follow their hijab code. And we have, you know, in all the streets, uh, morality police or guidance patrols or other morality guards in uh, all, you know, governmental or private uh, institution, university. They, co they search or, you know, control our hijab, makeup, behavior, or other things. Another method of strategies that uh, another strategy that Iranian state um, selected was gender segregation in a school, public transportation, some university, recreational space such as gym and stadiums or other, you know, some parks. So they separate us when we talk about gender apartheid. The concept that unfortunately is still United Nations didn't accept that, but they accept racial separation, segregation. This is, you know, happened for us. There, there is a big stadium in Iran 
uh, Azadi Stadium, 100,000 people can go there and none of them can be women. So this is some things we are talking about gender segregation. So another area that, that uh, they try to control that and uh, so control women, lives or body is Sharia law governing family and marriage. It systematically pushed women status to the marginalized. So some example just, for example, women lack equal rights in marriage, divorce and custody of their children. We don't have any right to divorce. This is for men, you know, or even marriage. If I want to marry in Iran, my father should give me a permission. It doesn't happen for men, just women. Birth certifications name a children's a child father. So women don't have any legal right for their own children, according to law. Child marriage is legal. We call that a kind of rape, actually. It doesn't have only harm for physical, you know, physically problem for children. This is a problem for girls, particularly from, uh, you know, poor classes or religious family that uh, have tried marriage in their family to go to a school and have a normal life. A woman's choice of job, place of residence, or ability to leave the country depends entirely on permission from her husband. So women cannot leave Iran or find job or go to a school if their husband don't want this. Polygamy was legalized and encouraged in Iran. And if a married woman found to be with another man than their husband, that punishment for them. The law doesn't protect women against honor killing. You know, honor killing is a big social problem in Middle East by father, brothers, and relatives. And not only the law doesn't support women, but also encourage men for this. Another area that Islamic State try to control women's lives is educational, I mean, educational um, system, officially and officially. They try to have institutionalized of gender segregation. First, I told you guys, we went to different schools. But the Islamization of gender attitude is further transmitted within universe, universal education through textbooks. Islamic ideology and sex role stereotypes were in all of our textbooks in elementary school, secondary school, and you know, uh, high school, university. And this is really important when new generation in Iran is going to reject all of uh, you know, those efforts to accept these gender roles. Don't forget, this is a woman revolution in Iran, a woman uh, social movements, and many men are working or you know, fighting with this system in the name of uh, woman life freedom. This is really important regarding gender socialization. Islamic State was failed actually in this process. So another method they have for education, they uh, deleted women. Women were excluded from some majors or university after 1979. In 2012, according to that research we did uh, 2020, uh, women were excluded from admission across 36 universities and in 77 majors in Iran. But maybe the main uh, area for them to control women's women and also the hijab has close relationship to that concept is labor market. You know, financial independence is some things that Islamists didn't want for women after 1979. First, many women were fired because of their hijab and personal behavior. Uh, which uh, Islamic Republic of Iran defined as moral issues. Uh, in my personal experience, you know, I didn't get any promotion in my job because I didn't follow their hijab code. But many women actually were fired after Islamic State and every year is happening. This is not just, you know, for the beginning of Islamic State in Iran. Segregation imposed cost on the employer. So in some cases, they prefer to hire only men, not women for you know, many employer. And of course, many jobs are just for men, not women. So as a Iranian woman, we find 
I can, you know, share my personal experience. We just find an area to improve our situation. That was education. We had a lot of limitation to go to university or other places for education, but we use any opportunity. We opened many gates and went to university. And in some years, the number of women in universities are more than men. For example, today, 65% of students are women in universities in Iran for higher education. But Islamic State limited our access to labor market. This table is really important. I believe the situation of Iran under Islamic State is really unique. 1979, two years before revolution, women literacy rate in Iran was 35%. Women's labor force participation was 12.9%. 1986, seven years after revolution in Iran. Oh, sorry. Women's liter literacy rate is 52, but women labor force participation reduced to 8.2. In 2016, 82.5% of women are educated, but only 14.9% of them are in labor market. That is really important because in the rest of the world, there is a correlation between women literacy rate and women's labor force particip uh, participation. And that is important for social movement. There are a lot of educated women don't have access to labor market. And this is a kind of discrimination they can understand. And of course they have protest against that. In 2021, 85% of women are educated, 85.5%, but only 70.3% of them are in labor market. That's really important. And during of pandemic, 75% of people who lost their job are women. It shows how much their situation is, you know, fragile in Iran. But with all, you know, catastrophe that Islamic State caused for Iran, for women in Iran, women in Iran are not silent victims, actually. 8 March 1979, a few days after, you know, Islamist took power in Iran, they organized massive street protests in Iran, unique. It seems more than 100,000 women came to the street to protest that. That was almost two weeks after Islamists took power. So women in that protest could organize themselves, but unfortunately they receive a little support from Iranian society because Iranian society and many parties in Iran, political parties or organization believes, believe women's demands were not a priority for them. And after that, the government Islamists brutally, brutally suppressed that social protest. But the slogan women use in that protest was really important. One of them is here. We didn't have a revolution to go backward. They wanted their own right, but you know, Islamic State or Islamic revolution had different idea. Another slogan here is really important. Azadi zan, azadi jame. Freedom of women, freedom of society. This is the meaning of the new slogan in Iran that came from Kurdish area to in Iran. Uh, woman life freedom, actually. So the government could suppress that protest, but Iranian women didn't give up. So during these 44 years, they have different kind of protest or you know resistance again for their own right. Women have been using overt and covert tools to counter their own operation for decades. In many protests in Iran or social movements we have, women are in front line of the protests. You can see in the, this photo here, uh, this is an environmental social movement actually in Southwest of Iran. And you can see most of them are women actually. Grassroots movement, they have a lots of organized, lots of grassroots movement to improve gender equality in Iran, address environmental problem and issues and also improving rights for children and ethnic minority in Iran. Uh, in different cities, a small village, all 
you know, them actually uh, are feminist sisters when they're to have official education for people to improve their knowledge about women rights, children rights, or other rights that we don't have after 1979, actually. They have different performance activities. One of those activities is Girls of Angola prote uh, protest. You know, um, this is Vida Mubahed, the right photo you can see here. Uh, left, sorry. Uh, on December 27, uh, 2017, uh, on the Engelab Street front of University of Tehran, she symbolically took her white head scarf off to protest against mandatory hijab in Iran. So she was here peacefully and silent and police arrested her. She went to prison. She was a young mom, actually. She had a, a two years baby. But her act actually uh, was repeated by other women in other streets in Iran. This photo, 2022, Woman Life Freedom, you can see women symbolically burn their headscarf. And actually, in this photo, you can see young Iranian women, woman burn, burning her hijab while ready to battle the security force with a piece of stone in this hand. So from this photo to this photo was four years. And we believe in the future, the face of social mo movement would change too. So, I told you guys, this movement in Iran has a long history. This is not new. This is for many years that Iranian people are fighting for their own basic right. So what is new? What is new from the last year actually in Iran? First, their demands on hijab and gender justice are clear and at the forefront of a, a nationwide protest in Iran. We receive a lot of support in different parts of Iran, opposite of some things that happened in 1979. So many men and communities joined with women to support of Iranian women for justice. We receive a lot of international attention and support. First, uh, we had a lot of solidarity and support from women in Turkey, Arab countries, that is really important for Iranian women. And then, you know, women or other communities in Europe, North of America, uh, America and rest of the world. Years of humiliation, repression of women by a misogynist regime have increased women anger. The theocratic regime has not reduced oppression, but the awareness of women and society has increased. So something is new here. Unlike in 1979, Iranian society currently supports women demands. And these demands is for a big social movement now in Iran. Woman Life Freedom is the slogan for the liberation movement of Kurdish women partisans in Turkey and Syria, who have endured decades of ethnic discrimination and have a history of fighting against patriarchy, national oppression, tyranny, and the consequence of colonization and ISIS. So this slogan actually came from Turkey, Syria, and Iraq to Iran. That is really important from Kurdish women. Because of that, Jan Jian Azadi, you can hear this slogan in different parts of Iran that people speak with different language, not only Kurdish. So the woman who used the women who used this slogan for the first time in Saqqas, Saqqas is a Kurdish city in Iran that Mahsa Jina Amini was born there. So the first day after she murdered by, was killed by government, uh, women in Saqqas use this slogan and they know, knew what is the meaning of this slogan. Janji and Azadi means society will not be free until women are free. And this is really a progressive slogan for Middle East. Because of that, I believe this social movement that was really painful. Last year was painful for all of us as Iranian, particularly outside of Iran. But it, uh, you know, it has a lot of hope for us too, because 
if Iranian men are uh, fighting for women right uh, under this progressive slogan, it means we will have good news in the future. So Zhanjian Azadi is the meaning of, uh, is actually another word for this slogan that women use in Iran 1979, freedom of women, freedom of society. And Iranian people know that very well now after, you know, 44 years when women rights were not important for that society in 1979. But I told you guys, this is a woman uh, revolution, woman uh, social movement, but the role of Kurdistan in Janjian Azadi in Iran is really important. Kurdistan is the name of a, a province in Iran, but uh, the Kurdish people live in this province and others like Azerbaijan, west of Azerbaijan, uh, Kermanshah, Hamedan, or, you know, in west of Iran. But all of those cities were really active during of this social movement. One reason is, yes, Mahsa Jina Amini is a Kurdish woman, but there is other reason too, because, you know, Kurdish people are under suppression for many years after forming of na uh, nation state in Iran, in Turkey, in Iraq, in Syria. There are a great nation divided in four countries, and unfortunately, they didn't have their own freedom for many years. But other things about this area is in Iran, we have modern parties in Kurdistan. We have some critics against all of those, but they really had effective politics acts during of this protest. For example, they could have urban strike in Kurdish area that other parts of Iran, people were not able to do some things like that. Maybe because of that in Tehran or rest of Iran, we have some slogan to show how much people respect the act of the Kurdish people in Iran. For example, they said, Kurdistan, Kurdistan, Iran. Kurdistan is the eyes and light of Iran. Or Tehran Bishe Kurdistan, Iran Mishe Golestan. If Tehran become like Kurdistan, Iran will be like Golestan. It means everything will be good. We will get a result of this social movement. So that is really important to know how much Kurdish cities are active in during of this social movement in Iran. Also, you know, today, even yesterday, in uh, some cities of Iran, the in Kurdish area and Baluch area in Iran, we have some street protests. So continuation of this revolutionary movement in Kurdistan and Sistan Baluchistan, another ethnic group in Iran, are Baluch. And there are under, uh, you know, severe, severe suppression because Baluch people are Sunni and Baluch, two minorities for them. So these two uh, parts of Iran are super active during of women life freedom movement. To know about the separation, on September 30, almost uh, 14 days after Masa Jina Amini was killed by government, the Islamic Republic of Iran shelled and killed more than 100 people in Zahedan, a Baluch city in Iran, and people were doing their prey. Friday prayer, actually. This is unique. The Islamic State killed Muslim people during a Friday prayer. 100 people. Baluch women, um, the most oppressed women in Iran due to their ethnicity, gender, religion, and class, have made a statement by joining the Women Life Freedom Movement and that they stand and fight with their sisters to build the first woman revolution in history. That is really important. They believe this is, you know, a woman revolution and they would like to have this solidarity with other sisters from other different, you know, uh, different ethnic group to create some things new in Iran, in the history actually. So where is this movement going? We know Iranian society has a lot of problems now. Iranian regime has been inefficient in different fields. Regarding economic issues, you might know Iran has second resource of gas and lots of, you know, money. This is not a poor country regarding natural resource or economy. But now, one of every three Iranians lives below the poverty line. 
Environmental issues in Iran is really serious. We have a lots of problems regarding water or you know, climate change in Iran, and the government was failed to manage natural resource correctly. We have a lots of protests, other protests about gender justice, and also about ethnic issues, religious issues. Actually, secularism is the request of several generations of Iranians, and today this request is obvious. So we have a lots of problem in Iran, and Iran has had many protests in the last decades. The response of uh, a state was this, violent repression. So Iranians' collective memory is full of oppression and humiliation. But there is another result too, the legitimization of the ruling group in Iran, even for some, you know, religious family. They killed about 600 people during Women Life Freedom Movement, including 80 children, 13, 14, 10 years old. They killed children. There is not any room to reform in Iranian perspective anymore. So Iranian people think about a structural change. So I believe this is a revolutionary uh, trajectory. Iran is in a way to uh, create a structural change. We know about the brutal repression of Islamic State. They have a history for that, actually. They even kill children. And we know about counter movements particularly in diaspora, some Iranian people are working some things that is not good for our social movement inside of Iran. They are going to join with uh, some, you know, ask help from some governments. I, I mean, for example, going to Israel, United States or Western countries, or even, you know, join to uh, some white wing groups outside of Iran. We call that counter movements for Iranian uh, social movement, but some things inside of Iran. Social movements in Iran are connecting, actually. Gender, class, and ethnic awareness are increasing. Some things that uh, we are learning during Women Life Freedom is here. Gender and ethnic, in, um, ethnic justice are intertwined. The success of this movement, Women Life Freedom, is guaranteed when this is the understanding of majority of Iranian society. I mean, Iranian society know we have other injustice in uh, our country, and for reaching to a justice for freedom, we need to pay attention to many things. And during this year, I believe the awareness about ethnic issue in Iran increased very well. We believe, I mean, some sociologists work about social movement in Middle East. We believe women movements determine the future of Middle East. But it is an intersectional movement with a different nature for the 21st century. In this case, I would like to back to one good point inside of Iran. I told you guys social movement in Iran are connecting to each other. People joined and know, for example, many feminists, even from, you know, center of Iran, that most of them are feminists, I mean, uh, Persian, they believe they cannot talk about women rights and ignore ethnic issues in Iran. It's happened for many ethnic, you know, activists in Iran too. They pay attention to women rights very well. But we need to have this connection to our neighbors too. I believe for a better situation for the future of the Middle East, we need some connection with social movements, grassroots movement in Turkey, in Arab countries, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. This is some things we need for future of Middle East and you know, uh, for future of children maybe. So I try to stop here. And actually have time if you guys would like to talk about this movement or have question or maybe a dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Professor Humanifar, for, <clears throat> for this interesting and insight insightful lecture. Now we can take some questions. So you can either uh, ask your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and uh, we can, I can take your questions. So let's see. 
Uh, Lauren Carr, go ahead. You can ask your question, Lauren. Oh, I was just applauding. I, I don't have a question. Oh, okay. Okay, I have a question, Alham. <clears throat> you mentioned that um, this Xinjiang Azadi movement um, was sparked by the Kurdish movement in, in other countries, in Syria, in Turkey. So, and, uh, you know, it has sparked a serious uh, women movement in Iran. So at this point, is there any like a woman organization overseas, let it be in Turkey or Syria or any other countries that are collaborating with women in, in, uh, in Iran, supporting them in any means, you know, that you can think of? Is there any like collaboration, international collaboration between women organizations that are supporting this? Yeah, actually this is our wish for future, but mm -hmm. we don't have any, you know, connection like that. But I know immediately after this movement formed in Iran, uh, our sisters in Turkey and Arab country were super active. They joined to, you know, in streets, or even in online or have some, you know, online discussion or other things. But I believe in general, this is a weakness for our area. We need to make this connection, you know, more obviously and physically. I believe after 1979, the Islamic State tried to destroy all organizations we had in Iran. So we have many Iranian women organization outside of Iran and many activists inside of Iran. They try to don't have any organization because this is a threat for them. The government can arrest them or other things, but they do many great things inside of Iran. But I believe outside of Iran, we have this opportunity. And recently there is some social networks of Iranian women. For example, one of them is Feminist for Gina. They try to make this international uh, connection with progressive women organization outside of Iran. So this is something we need, even not only for women, for environmental issues. When we are talking about environmental degradation, because I'm environmental sociologist too, when we are talking about environmental issues inside of Iran, absolutely we are talking about problem in Turkey and Iraq too. We cannot find any solution without any connection with you know, grassroots movement inside of these countries. Mm -hmm. So this is a weakness for us in Middle East and I hope in the future we can make mm -hmm. this connection. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me see if we have any more questions. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I know that Iran is like consisting of varying various uh, ethnic groups, religious groups, and um, you know, and, and many more. So like in terms of you know, like as a uh, in terms of the support that women are are receiving from these uh, different communities. Uh, like who are often involved in uh, supporting this movement? Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, in many cities, we have this protest of supports or, uh, you know, many men actually were killed by government during of this social movement. Mm -hmm. But two areas were so active. Uh, unfortunately, opposite of the past, Azerbaijan was not so active during this movement. It has many reasons or Arab area. But mm -hmm. Kurdish area and Baluch area were super active with two different faiths. For example, you even can hear some religious slogan in Baluchistan, but mm -hmm. not in Kurdish area. And there are they have a secular perspective, better than the rest of Iran, maybe. So I believe uh, we cannot talk about women life freedom in Iran and ignore the name of Kurdistan. That is really right. active and supportive. And because of that, people in Tehran called if Tehran be like Kurdistan, Iran will be Kurdistan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. I think Mujahid has a question. Mujahid, go ahead. You are muted, Mujahid. Yeah. Okay. Rachel can go on. She has raised too. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Rachel. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Humin, for 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 very interesting presentation today. I can't help comparing the things that you're talking about with 
the various liberation movements that we've had in the United States. And the first thing that comes to my mind is the difficulty in connecting women's liberation with the rights of black people or people of color, or all of these, these other social movements. And you, I, you strongly pointed out at the end of your talk that this is really going to bring meaningful change in Iran when people can recognize that both women on a gender basis and others on a basis of ethnicity or race are being discriminated against by the same system. I feel like here, that's a difficult point to get across that people always want to fight for a single identity rather than reaching that intersectional position. So are there things about the way Iranian society is structured today that gives you maybe more hope that that intersectional power can be achieved sooner than it has been here? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yes, this is the problem for many social movements in different parts of the world. And in the United States, we have history for that. Uh, in Middle East, we have this problem, not only in Iran, you know. Um, we have many catastrophe during several decades in different countries in that area. And unfortunately, you know, progressive group focus in ethnic justice, religious justice, women justice, but ignore other groups. This is a big problem. I'm in, in general for women life freedom, I'm really optimistic. I believe recently many people changed their perspective regarding ethnic issue in Iran. You know, Iran, exactly like Turkey, like Iraq, like many countries, not only in Middle East, in the rest of the world, after forming nation states, always when ethnic group in Iran or in Turkey, in Iraq, in Syria, in Afghanistan, talk about their own ethnic right, people talk about separation. But, you know, uh, Iranian government, if you want to suppress court people, the Arab people in Iran as minority, they call they are have connection with United States, with Israel, and have, you know, uh, tools to suppress people. But people don't buy this anymore inside of Iran. This is really valuable for us. And I believe, um, during of movement, we can learn many things. Social movement is like a teacher and we are going to learn many things. Even, you know, this is opportunity for us to talk about, you know, rest of Muslim countries to know what is because many people think when people are burning their hijab in Iran, this is a kind of Islamophobia. However, 98% of people inside of Iran are Muslim or were born in Muslim family. They're talking about mandatory hijab or some things like that. But still, we don't know how we can frame this request. And this is opportunity for us to talk. So yes, that was big problem, not only in the United States. I know about you know, Black feminism here and many problems we have about justice in the United States regarding even you know, good social movement. We have the same problem in Middle East and even worse in some cases. But I believe it's going to change. And this kind of social movement is helping us to know other aspect of justice in the same time. So I told you guys, that was a woman revolution in Iran. But now we are talking about Kurdish question too. And when we are talking about Kurdish issue in Iran, we are talking about Kurdish issue in Middle East, in four other countries too. And that is really important. So I'm optimistic in general, but I know as a sociologist work about the fact this is really difficult. Maybe again, we made some mistake like 1979. Maybe counter movement can, you know, have some divisions for our social movement. But I believe this is like a teacher for us. During this year, we learn a lot. So I'm optimistic. But you, you are right about this problem all social movements had for justice. And one reason they were not successful is this actually. Uh, Mujahid, I think you had a question. Yeah, I do. Um, thank you, Ilan, for for a very informative uh, lecture. Uh, you seem to suggest that intersectionality is going to make things better, and uh, I wonder if that's really the case. Um, it might complicate things. It might make it more difficult. But I'm leaving that as a question mark. <laughs> you don't have to address that one. My question had more to do with your uh, statement that the women's movement uh, will determine the future of the Middle East. Uh, on what grounds uh, 
you know, have you reached that conclusion? Uh, is there something intrinsically different in women's movement? Mm -hmm. uh, something that makes them better than workers or, you know, ethnic movement and so on. Is it the numbers, uh, perhaps, you know, demographic, you know, population wise? Uh, is it question of legitimacy and so on? So if you could elaborate that, I would appreciate. Thank yes. You. Yes, uh, that's a good question. Actually, we have many different injustice in Middle East in our area. But why women? Because of this slogan that Kurdish women created for us, woman life freedom. You know, women are under severe suppression in different countries in that area, Afghanistan, Iran, in Turkey in another way, in Iraq in another way, in Arab countries, you know. But, you know, actually their perspective most of Iranian feminists now are fighting for ethnic justice too. Even when there are not uh, Turk or Kurd or Arab, there are Persian maybe. Because I believe this is behind the feminist perspective. Because feminist perspective is telling us, teaching us actually, we cannot reach to justice or freedom if we don't pay attention to other aspects of life. For example, 1979, some leftist group in Iran believes, doesn't matter, women wear hijab, working class is going to be free after Islamic State. So they ignore our rights just because of this illusion, maybe working class be free. Working class is not free in Iran. Their situation is worse in Middle East. And women, you know, I believe this is a symbolic issue because in Middle East, we are located in patriarchy belt. Patriarchal system in our area is really a strong. So this is a strong chain. If we can break that, we can break all you know, chains too. Because of that, not it, this is not only my idea. Some other sociologists from this area or even European sociologists believe this movement in, in Middle East, I mean women movement, can change our situation in better way in the future. So yes, I believe ethnic um, movement is really important. Environmental movement is important. Working, uh, I mean, labor movement is really important, but this is women and the experience of Iran can be a good document for us. You know, This is really important for the future of our area in my perspective. I think we have next question from Daria Dogan. Yes, Daria, go ahead. Alhamdulillah, as always, it's so great to learn from you. <laughs> Perhaps I have to say this. Uh, my question is about the economics, the economic situation in Iran. So not too long ago, there were like very vibrant protests as a, as a, as a reaction to the economic situation in Iran. But this most recent one, it's mostly about the Jinjian Azadi, right? Women's rights. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious that how do you think the the financial situation and uh, and and the super like highly <laughs> increased inflation and the, the worsening economic situation in Iran might also be impacting uh, the current protests. Mm -hmm. You know, I told you guys the women are marginalized from labor market in Iran, and now we have a big social problem. Iran is called feminization of poverty because we don't have access to job and but many women are educated too and in the same time we can see the rest of iran because of many problems we have regarding economic issues already we have a lots of protests so i believe it's going to join to each other because of that i said the social movement in iran are going to connect to each other I believe economic issues was one reason for many people to support this social movement. And, but the situation of women regarding economic issues is worse than men in Iran. So they have more reason to be in protest and want to change the structure. But in general, uh, this is for two decades, I believe, particularly after uh, Islamic State applied no liberalist policy in economy, the situation of working class and middle class in Iran is awful. I told you guys, um, every um, one of every three Iranians are living under poverty line. So of course it's encouraged society to have protests. Iranian people for everything came to a street to have protests because they are under severe suppression. And I believe economic issues, not only for general in uh, Iranian society is a big problem, but also for women. And when we are talking about women rights, 
one part back to financial issues they have because they're marginalized from labor market too. That was your question, Dario? Yes, you answered pretty well, thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions? Looks like we got all the questions, okay. Thank you again, Professor Humilfar, for this great talk, for all the attendees. Thank you for joining today. Thank uh, you Alicia. for Zahra, thank you to Zahra Institute for attention to Iranian women rights. We really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mujahid, did you have something to say? Oh, okay, okay, you're applauding. Uh, okay. I'm just saying thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank I saw it. I read. Okay, okay. I wish you a great day and hope to see you all soon in another Zahra's event. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.